Apple just released their brand new M2 chip in a couple weeks ago. Well, we are a little bit late, and I bet that you have already watched a lot of review or not. But today, we are going to do something different. You are going to expect a deep dive into M2's power efficiency, peak performance, architecture, and also, we have done some exclusive tests that nobody has ever done it before. So get ready, it's time to roll. The first thing that we are going to talk about, instead of performance, is the battery life. Macs are known to have a great battery life ever since they migrate to Apple Silicon. On a machine with a form factor like MacBook Air, battery life is maybe more important than performance to its potential buyer. However, the problem is, we know that Macs generally last longer than PC, but by how much? I mean, on PC, you have delegated tools like PC Mark 10, which is going to give you a number under different levels of static load. But first, it is not available on Mac. Yes, you can run it on a virtual machine, but seriously? And second, the number that PC Mark gives us isn't quite like how you feel. For example, this Asus ZBook 13, PC Mark rated the battery life as 13 hours. That is not so far away behind the M1 MacBook Air, according to Apple's website. But as someone who daily drives both machines, I can tell you that is not true. In fact, battery experience on those two machines are entirely different. You can feel it if you use it, but it's not easy to show you in numbers. Apparently, what we need to do here is a battery life test that you can refer on. We are going to drain the battery under the same condition and tell you the exact hour and minutes of how long this machine lasts. Draining the battery is simple. The challenge is how to drain it like the way you do. So, should we play a video until it dies? No, it's too simple as a task. Your scenario is probably more complicated than that. Alright, should we just run Sunny Bench until it dies? Definitely not. That is such a heavy load that you might never see your battery draining as fast in real life. Looks like we need a more comprehensive test than those two. Maybe you should combine several tasks together. To give you a good demonstration of how long your battery lasts, let me introduce you the Geeker One Laptop Operation Cycle 1.0. We analyzed how average users use such laptops and summarized it as a one-hour homogeneous cycle. The standard goes the same for both Windows and Mac. The one-hour cycle is evenly divided into the six 10 minutes block, and it covers six most commonly used cases of your laptop. That is, the Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and then web browsing, online video watching in 4K, and instant messaging. Also, before the cycle started, we will open the music app that constantly plays music from the internet. Other variables are also being controlled. The screen brightness of all laptops is set to 116. No peripherals will be connected during the test, and they all connected into the same Wi-Fi hotspot. For Windows machines, we have two different set of power options. They are located in the new settings app and the legacy control panel. Both of them is going to take effect because Microsoft. For this test, we will set those options to balanced and balanced. Also, we wrote a little Python script to automate the entire process, so every single operation will be executed precisely in the exact second as we want it. Now we have our testing strategy, now it's time to get some laptops. Our main course here is those two MacBooks with the latest M2 chip, the Air and Pro. We also have the previous generation 13 inches MacBook Pro and the 14 inches M1 Pro MacBook Pro. Whew. This machine will going to tell us whether the M2 improves in power efficiency since it has exactly the same chassis as the ongoing model. And this big boy here is going to tell us whether it costs battery life to achieve a stronger peak performance. For Windows laptop, we have the latest XPS 13 with Intel 1216P inside, and Asus ZenBook 13 with a Ryzen 6800U. Note that this machine has 13 hours of battery life rated by PC Mark. Those two notebooks are choosing to represent Team Blue and Team Red. Good luck to them. With everything in place, it's time to do some real thing. Ready, set, go. Now, all six machines running our automation script. Let's see which QD gave up the first. Time goes by. In about three and a half hours, our XPS 30 Plus dies. Well, well, well. Is that what you call Intel Evo 35 Premium Laptop? Alright, the computation continues. Looks like the second one is the Asus ZenBook. As the representative of Team Red, it lasts almost 6 hours. Meanwhile, the battery of all Macs is only about half empty. Guess which Mac dies the first? It's a big brother, with largest battery and largest chip, M1 Pro. It lasts a bit over 10 hours. Then, the battle is between the more efficient M2 MacBook Air and the larger battery M1 MacBook Pro. And the winner is the larger battery. They are pretty close though. The latest MacBook Air lasts half a day, while the M1 MacBook Pro lasts about one more hour. Last, our battery king, it's the M2 MacBook Pro lasts 14 hours and 41 minutes. To be honest, I know Macs are going to be better, but I didn't expect by this much. I mean, 10 more hours of battery life? That's insane. 
In fact, if you really deep dive into Ryzen 6000 series, you will find its power efficiency isn't so far behind Apple under full load. I guess the additional instruction set on x86 is not the only problem that caused such a pathetic battery life. So where exactly is the issue? One thing that I find that was particularly interesting during our test is the single core power consumption. When we run Cinebench, M2 draws about 20 watts in multi-core and a bit over 5 watts in single core. Meanwhile, the 6800U draws about 25 watts in multi-core. That is not bad. But in a single core test, guess what? It draws 18.9 watts. At this moment, the system is giving this particular core even 1.4 volts, pushing it to 4.5 gigahertz. That is some terrifying number in the world of CPU. Essentially speaking, when you, the user, ask for a heavy single core job, the system will boost one core to achieve a better performance. But the cost is a exponentially higher wattage. Don't get me wrong, this is not a bad thing. This strategy is being called Precision Boost Overdrive by AMD and Turbo Boost by Intel. It is indeed going to give you some extra performance if you fully loaded your core. But remembering our JROSA, there were no such a heavy job. Well, this is where we spotted the problem. Let's take a little experiment. Open up browser on this Xperia 13 Plus, go to a heavy web page, and just simply refresh. And here we have, boom! The power consumption here reached more than 20 watts. I'm just refreshing the web page, but the machine was overclocking like it's facing a ton lots of workload. And then the battery start to draw and the fan start to blow. If you do the same thing on Mac, you will find the clock speed stay at 1. something gigahertz no matter how you refresh the page. And it only consumes 4 watts maximum. During our testing cycle, this happens a lot. Every time when we open a new app, new browser tab, or even when we started to play the slide, Every single unnecessary boost on Windows machine will consume a bit more power than Mac, and then those little power gaps accumulate, ultimately create such a huge differences in battery life. It's not so hard to understand why this is happening. Both Intel and AMD make desktop processors. On desktop, the limiting factor of the performance is the TDP. So when you ask for a single core load, the chip will overclock to the maximum within its TDP limit. And without being anxious about battery life, that is great. That is indeed going to give you some extra responsiveness. But on laptop, where battery life and temperature is critical to user experience, adapting the same strategy isn't quite a great idea. Those OEMs should definitely tune and shape more just for the laptop. The boost strategy is not the only problem that we found. Another very big difference between Windows and Mac is the idle power consumption. Here we have both machine at desktop, open one browser, no background task, and we are going to check the wattage number. On XPS 13, you will find that the SOC power is running around 1 to 5 watts, but the core only consumes a tiny little part of it. The rest of it is the I.O., PCIe, and other devices. The wattage number is recorded on the XPS 13 with only two Type-C port. It doesn't even have a headphone jack, come on! The load is not a large number by any means, but it is, and it will be, always there no matter what you're doing on your laptop. On Max, especially on M2, the out of core consumption is a lot lower. On a machine with a larger chip, like this M1 Pro, we find that the load is around 1 watt. This is one of the reasons why the 14 inches MacBook Pro, despite having a larger battery, lasts shorter than our M2 or M1 machines in our test. So, we find there were two significant factors that contribute to the devastating battery life on Windows laptop. The first and the most important one is the smart boosting strategy. It draws a lot of power when you don't really need them. The second one is the out-of-core consumption. It's going to take your battery life away as long as your machine turns on. Interestingly, none of them is about the instruction set. So, it is not about x86 or ARM. The first problem can be solved by purely software optimization, and the second one is more about the chip design, or rather the idle unit of the SLC can be turned off. I mean, there is some efficiency differences between x86 and ARM due to the additional instruction set. But, dear manufacturers, please don't just blame the battery life on the architecture and do nothing about it. There is still a plenty of things that you can do to give us a better experience on x86. After the battery life, it's time to look at the performance. Let's look at the die shot. Actually, the core design of M2 is directly from A15, the P-Core Avalanche, the E-Core Blizzard. In terms of core layout, M2 is not so different from M1. One thing worth noting on the die shot is the cache design. The 16 megabyte L2 cache is not evenly spread among all cores, but instead, one of the P-Core got the most of it. Such designs aim to ensure a minimum access lag to single core tasks. The E-Core also got 4 MB of cache. Since those two core clusters can access each other's cache, we have a total of 20 MB of L2 cache. That's some improvement over M1. 
Also, both P-Core and E-Core on the M2 is receiving a frequency boost. Note that the E-Core is not so tiny. It is more like a slightly smaller performance core. So an improvement on that will have some impact on multi-core performance. We will see it in our CPU test in a moment. The GPU, on the other hand, have a huge improvement over M1, just like A15 over A14. Now we have more GPU cores and a higher core frequency. Additionally, the memory receives a upgrade as well. M2 is using LPDDR5 6400MHz 128-bit memory. This could also benefit the GPU. I wouldn't doubt the 35% improvement they said on their event. However, I don't think that is a game changer because, well, no gamers ever wanted to buy a Mac. It's time to pump in some benchmark. Today, we choose to measure the performance of a silicon by SPAC CPU 2017. You're probably not being so familiar with it. Long story short, SPAC is a non-profit organization that makes standardized benchmark for the semiconductor industry. And the CPU 2017 is the latest standard they released for, well, CPU. This benchmark includes 43 different subjects, covering from network simulation, media encoding, AI, all the way to 3D rendering, and computational fluid dynamic. They all fall into two general categories, integer and floating point. The integer test is closer to your daily use, and the floating point is more about scientific computation and all those data center stuff. Unlike most of other benchmarks where you can just click and run, for SPAC CPU, you will have to compile it by yourself. So the choice of a compiler will impact the score. For example, if you're using ICC on Intel processor, you will get some optimization for that particular chip. In order to compare it apple to apple, we will be using the open source GCC on Linux for both Apple Silicon and x86. Also, to minimize the error bringing by the thermal and memory size, we will only run those tests on one single core. Our results show that for both integer and floating point, Apple Silicon is significantly better than our body over there running x86. Comparing to M1, M2 got about 60% improvement on integer and 9% improvement on floating points. Those numbers are higher than a 9.4% clock speed boost, which means it is not just the overclock. Apple does improve their IPC this time. For our body running x86, the outer lake got a higher score than the 3 plus, even at lower frequency. In terms of IPC, Intel do have something over AMD. Take a look at each test, it tells the same story about M1 and M2. Generally speaking, the integer improves more than floating point. Some of those tests are worth noting. X264 media encoding and Sudoku solving. Apple Silicon has gained huge advantage over our x86 player. For compiler and network simulation tests, Outer Lake constantly beats the 3 plus and almost catching up with Apple. Interestingly, on solving Einstein equation, our Intel 1260p is considerably better than others, making it the best mobile processor to simulate black hole. Yes. Simulate black hole if you ever need on your laptop. That's for our CPU. To measure the performance of GPU, we will use 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme. In terms of raw performance, the GPU improvement is huge. It's even larger than what Apple claimed on their event. Efficiency wise, the M2 draws 13 watts during the test, which is 30% higher than M1, yet still very environmental friendly. As for our x86 body, well, M2 almost doubled the score of Intel XE. This could make those Macs a good gaming machine, but, well, you know, there were really not a lot of games on Macs right now. At this point, I believe that you already have a very deep understanding of how M2 is supposed to perform. Next, let's look at the real-world applications. First, Cinema 4D, a professional 3D rendering tool where we can measure its performance by a standalone benchmark app, Cinebench R23. In multi-core test, M2 is about 12% better than its predecessors. Compared with x86 players, the 4P4E core configuration on the M2 has no chance to stand against Intel and AMD, which has more core and larger cores. For single core, M2 is only 5% ahead of M1. However, we find the clock speed of M2 is only at 3.3 GHz during the test, which means the score is lower than what it can do. Maybe it has something to do with Mac OS tuning. Our next test is Blender, another very commonly used 3D rendering tool. We are going to benchmark it by recording the time taken for rendering two scenes, the BMW and the classroom. On the BMW, M2 got an impressive 22% advantage over M1. It's almost catching up with those larger size x86 competitors. On the classroom, M2 only got about 30% ahead of M1. Note that the classroom runs noticeably longer than BMW, so that the thermal become a limiting factor. The M2 MacBook Air without a fan is not even as good as M1 with a fan. So if you are going to do some rendering on your laptop, active cooling is a must. But here's one exception, our XPS 30 Plus with dual fans. It's slower than a fanless machine. What the heck you doing, Dell? Failure. 
and we have also tested Blender running with GPU acceleration. The advantage of GPU of M2, now get an answer. We got about 39% ahead of M1. Our DNA 2 also supports GPU rendering over OpenGL on the latest version of Blender, but it is not so effective. I guess gaming is what RDNA 2 was designed for. Interestingly, the Intel XE, which they claim is good for productivity, does not even support Blender GPU rendering. Next, the Creative Cloud. To ensure everything is running natively on Apple Silicon, we can only run Project Bench Script on Premiere and After Effects. However, our M2 MacBook Pro has only 8GB of RAM, which results to a lower score in the Premiere test, and it cannot even finish the After Effects test. So, if you want to do some video editing, you will have to go at least 60 gig. For extra dollar, on to Premiere, even the fanless MacBook Air can huge advantage against M1 MacBook Pro, thanks to new GPU. The same story happened to After Effects. And compared to x86 alternatives, this is truly a world of differences. Speaking of video editing, we have also tried Media Encoder. Apple Silicon got a very powerful hardware encoder built in, and it is getting better on the M2. The result is as expected. The new GPU and media encoder works together on this test makes a whopping 45% improvement over M1. That is just one incremental upgrade. What are you gonna do next, Apple? But here's one thing I have to mention. Even with such a powerful GPU, Apple still limits the number of external monitors to one on all laptops with M2. I don't know that it's the engineering problem or Apple just doing that on purpose. Yes, when you plug in the second monitor, nothing is going to happen until, well, we unplug the first one. Thank you for joining us. Now it's time to talk about thermos. After 10 minutes of Cinebench cycle, all MacBook with fan does not settle at all. The MacBook Air without a fan lost about 10% of its performance by the end of the cycle, and the power drops to 12 watts, which is frankly not bad, especially if you consider the body temperature is totally acceptable. When we try to tear down the machine, it will be not surprised that the thermal solution is very primitive. You have some thermal compound that moves some heat from the chip to this thin little piece of aluminum, and that's it. More importantly, they intentionally sunk the CPU area, leave the thin layer of air in between to prevent the heat coming out from your laptop. And that has made me wonder, what if we allow the heat goes out? This should give us some extra performance. To do that, we really just need one little piece of thermal pad to fill that gap. And then, something interesting happened. It does perform ever so slightly better after turn one of Cinebench. But the surface will go as high as 52 Celsius degree and it will still throttle, just a bit slower. After all, you just have a larger heat sink to store heat, but the heat does not necessarily dissipate away. This is a very dumb modification and I am just not recommending anyone doing this. I did it so you don't have to. For those MacBook waste fan though, we can burn our CPU and take a peek at the power management rule. We use LeanPack to stress the CPU and find that the power output is locked at 25 watts for both M1 and M2. Does that mean the power limit has been the same? Well, it's not that simple. If you open another 3D Mark to stress the CPU at the same time, we find that the M1 is still locking at 25 watts, but M2 jumps to 30 plus. So our speculation is M1 has a power limit of 25 watts for the entire SOC, while the M2 is only limiting the CPU. The SOC power of the M2 will pump to the maximum as long as the temperature allowed. By far, I believe that you already have a very comprehensive understanding of the new M2 chip. Our testing results shows that M2 is getting better on CPU, but not by so much. We have a slightly better peak performance, slightly better power efficiency, stuff that M1 is already great at, M2 brings it one step forward. But the GPU, on the other hand, takes a great leap forward. Those big brothers of M2, the M2 Pro, the M2 Max, and the M2 Ultra will have more GPU cores, and they will have some furious performance. I can't wait to see how that is going to work out. All right, that's the end of today's video, to be honest. It is a lot of work to make this happen. So if you like our content, a like and a subscribe would be splendid. All right, thanks for watching. Catch you guys next time.